Welcome to the People, Planet, Profit podcast. I'm Hayley Jarrick, CEO of the Supply Chain Sustainability School. This podcast was recorded as part of an event and video series developed by one of the school's working groups. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Village Voices, an industry event series um, with experts in local government in supply chain brought to you from the Supply Chain Sustainability School's local government working group. Today, we're joined by Daniel Cable, who's the ESD Infrastructure Officer at the Mornington Peninsula Shire Council. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we've set up all of these sort of interviews the similar way. And the first question I'm going to ask you is sort of set me the scene and describe the area, the demographics of what's it like in Mornington Peninsula. Yeah, sure. So Mornington Peninsula is in the southeast of Melbourne. It's sort of, you go all the way south and, and you're on the peninsula. Uh, it's an amazing place. It, it's a real tourist destination. We get, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of tourists every year, but, but it's a lot. Um, we've got a large stretch of coastline. It's something like 10% of, of Victoria's coastline in our LGA. So it's a really important part of what we do. We've got about 70% green wedge. So that covers a lot of agriculture and a lot of um, bushland and biodiversity protection as well. Um, and then some distinct townships. And we've got um, communities uh, all along the spectrum of social and economic status. So it's not, um, uh, there's a lot of wealthy people that have um, the ability to, to sort of dedicate a lot of their time to climate action. We've also got a lot of challenges with people that don't have that time and ability. Awesome. And if I was to try and give people a scope of like, how many people are in that that zone so if I look up your yeah, you know there's about 164,000 people median age is about 46 um but like you said not all of them have the capacity so about a hundred thousand of those are not working would you say and then like you said with that varied um economic spread so there are a lot of people there that could do some things but some of them don't have the capacity to be able to help out um, and I think that gives us a really good sense of that um, I think it's, it's also for... really sorry it's also really a geographical um Base. So yeah, some townships are, are, um, are not the higher end of the spectrum and some are on the lower end. So it's, it's not necessarily mixed all throughout. Yeah. And if we talk about like the temperature, so we're talking the very bottom. So for those who aren't familiar with Australian de um, <laughs> geography, if you look at a map of Australia, you head to the bottom right hand corner, that's Victoria. Um, you'll see a little bay poking up at the bottom of that. And I always describe one from particular as like, if Melbourne were the eyes, Mornington Peninsula is the smile of the bay, right? Like that's sort of where we're heading um, and it curves nicely. And like you said, it's like 70% green um, green space through there. So for people who have been in the area and might be trying to recall what it's like, what are sort of some of the touristy places that people might have visited or been able to recall from being down? Uh, we're really lucky to have two bays. So we've got the Port Phillip Bay side, and so that's everywhere from you know, Sorrento and Portsea uh, to, to Dramana and Rye. And these are just amazing beaches on the bay side. So it's all calm, amazing sand and everything like that. Um, there's really iconic beach boxes, which is um, something you, you probably would stand out. And then on the other side, we've got the Western Port Bay. So that's the real surf beaches. And um, some of them are you know internationally renowned. Um, in the middle, we've got a, a lot of um, wineries in particular. It's a really strong um, uh, tourist section, you know, a lot of wineries and really, uh, really nice restaurants that go along with that. Yeah, excellent. And I'm thinking like always pack a jumper if you're from anywhere else, because I think, you know, what is it, summer, sort of like mid-25, mid-20s, mid winter, sort of mid-teens, is that sort of the temperature range we're talking about? Usually, yeah. We've been really lucky. The, the floods have just been hitting the the um, north and west of Victoria. We've been relatively untouched down here in most areas anyway. Awesome. So I hope that just sort of gives everybody a bit of perspective of those who didn't know where Mornington Peninsula was or the type of lifestyle that, that is in that area. But I think it's a really good context for like the next question is that so working at the council, sort of what are the sustainability objectives and targets and and what sort of your makeup of team look like? Yeah, sure. So we're, we're really guided by our climate emergency plan. That's the, the big document that, that um, guides all of our sustainability policy and targets. Um, we declared a climate emergency in 2019 and then had the plan adopted in 2020 and have been working on implementation ever since. In terms of uh, what, what our uh, staffing is, we have a unit called Climate Change and Sustainability with something like 40 or 50 staff, uh, and that's broken up into climate change, circular economy and waste, and water and coasts. So um, a lot of it's operational, but a lot of it's really strategic and, and working on delivery of the policy and trying to work with different areas of the council and the community. 
Um, the big target that we have is uh, net zero community emissions by 2040, which is um, set by the, the Climate Emergency Plan and really well supported by the community. And there's a whole range of uh, other, other targets and actions in the plan that talk to the other areas, not just emissions. And that's a pretty sizable team, right? So for, for the size of the population that you are, that's a pretty hefty team. And I think that really sort of, for me, that's a, a massive signal to people who want to start a business in the area, move to the area and live there, that this is a big thing on your agenda, right? Like it's kind of, and 2040 is a pretty like beefy target for have community emissions down to that level. It's not just sort of council operations. So I think there's some there's some really strong targets and backed by some really good activities and resourcing for that, which I think is a really good measure of success in that space as well. So I'm imagining that you've been a couple of years into sort of implementing the plan and there's probably a few things that have been doing really well. So what's what do you stand out for things that um, are things that you do really well or things that you're really strong in, both in the uh, in the council itself, but also in the community and some of the community work that you're doing. Um, it's a it's a good question. Um, in the, in the community, we'll maybe um, fit them both separately. In the community, we've always had a really active community in environmentalism, and you know historically that's been things like beach cleanup days and um, you know, Clean Up Australia Day, and and you know, making sure that our pristine beaches stay pristine. And then also biodiversity. So we have a, a huge network of friends groups that look after particular reserves or look after particular areas that, are, that have um, biodiversity significance. Uh, and they've been active for, for decades and, and do an amazing job. Recently, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been a lot of movement um, from the community in the energy space as well, and really wanted to support the transition to, to you know, uh, zero carbon energy. So that's things like you know, promoting solar installs, promoting changing over from um, gas appliances to hit the electric and that kind of thing. But then also talking about community energy and how uh, different models where that could work. And um, you know, in the last couple of years as well, uh, moving to electric vehicles, which is uh, not had a lot of uptake in Australia, but we've got a really strong community looking for solutions in that area. And that's a challenging one because it's not something the community delivers, or the council delivers. It, it's got to be at a, a sort of state and federal level as well. There's a lot of advocacy work that goes on there collaboratively with them. In terms of um, council, we've had a, a lot of um, really good successes in, in uh, climate change projects. So that's things like solar rollouts, uh, changing over our streetlights to LED, uh, behavior change and education programs uh, um, and, and a lot of things like that. We've um, uh, rolled out the food organic, uh, uh, food and garden organics program to collect organic waste in our uh, bin collection, which diverts a whole lot of waste from landfill, which has been uh, going for the last couple of years. Um, and so we're, we're trying to turn our attention, uh, continuing those programs, but then also uh, trying to embed sustainability across the organisation. That's our real focus at the moment because a lot of decisions get made uh, you know, at every level of, of, of local government um, from every team and, and unit. So that's things like you know, community engagement. It's things like procurement and uh, infrastructure delivery, emergency management and um, climate risk analysis and all these things where uh, every one of them is a, is a podcast topic on its own. But, but uh, we're, we're trying to look at all of them um, and embed it across the whole organization. It's amazing to hear that. And I think that um, a lot of people would be envious of that position, right? Because it's kind of, I remember sort of 15, 20 years ago, it was everyone needs a sustainability officer. And they, that poor person would get pumped with all of the initiatives and expected to do things in isolation of everything else. And these, and more recently, it's sort of really come to that um, that realisation that unless this is embedded everywhere, it's not going to have any meaningful impact or it's going to be more expensive or it's going to be harder to implement. So I really like the idea of integrating it through, which is obviously sort of the long game. Um, and, and you're right, it takes more time, it takes more effort. You have to educate a lot of people within within council and outside of council as to the types of things that you're trying to do and why. Um, and I can see that that's kind of, but that's the, you know, the real game changer in terms of changing um, the way that and how um, that things operate on a daily basis so that you're not only just sort of fixing things that are currently there, but also everything new that comes in is going to be filtered um, with that sustainability lens um, and really develop some of those new programs so that you're not constantly trying to fix things um, that aren't sustainable in operations, which must be great yeah. for someone like you because you get to focus on the fun stuff, right? Uh, yeah, it's it's always fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Like council makes a lot of decisions that have a very long 
you know, lifetime. We build assets the last 50 or 100 years. We work with community groups that have been around for decades. And so the decisions we make now are, will resonate for quite a while. And so how do we how do we inform all those decisions? And, and one of the key things I think um, guides a lot of us is the, the idea that like, we can't continue with business as usual. Now, that was that was one of the big impetuses from for the, the councillors that declared a climate emergency, that business as usual is is not going to serve us well in the long term. And we're seeing now not even in the short term. So we're, we're trying to um, do that kind of, um, fundamental transition in the way of thinking. And we, we've had a lot of successes and a lot of people down here are already on board, so we haven't had to work that hard, but there's a lot of pain points for sure. For sure. Um, so you touched on that um, some of that uh, the 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 staffing departments. Um, one of those areas is focused on circular economy and waste. Um, that's sort of a big topic right now, especially we've got um, sort of federal and state impetus to try and go. Let's make Australia circular by twenty thirty. Um, there's a lot of work happening in um, from Circular Australia and the Australian Circular Economy Hub, um, all sort of pushing for circularity. So what are you doing at a council level around circularity and waste in particular? That's a that's a really big question. Um, it, it's a hard one. So the, the team has kind of recently transitioned from the waste team into the circular economy and waste team because of that exact issue. You know, we're we're starting to change our thinking into not just processing waste and taking it away from where it's generated, but how we can see it as a resource. And so we're still relatively new in in that way of thinking, and we've got a long way to go. Uh, but I think broadly so does the industry so the things we're trying to focus on is you know how can we use recycled materials in our infrastructure how can we um, collect uh, our residents waste and, and sort it in the best way possible and make sure that some of the harder things to recycle there's, there's options for those um, and then one of the things we're, we're hoping to support more is uh, the um, commercial and industrial areas on the peninsula how can we support them in their journey um, where there's, there's a lot of businesses and you know, farmers on the peninsula that want to do a whole lot more and the solutions just aren't readily available. I, one of the problems we have is you know, we're just we're quite far away from Melbourne. We're something like um, 80 k's away from Melbourne. So any any uh, reprocessing or, or um, those kind of facilities that are in the Northwest, they're just not available to us in any real way, in any real volume. And so how do we, develop that down here and you know, this is also an amazing opportunity for local growth um, and, and uh, economic benefit so there's a lot of reasons to do um, to do a lot of work in this area and we're starting the journey it's really refreshing to hear some um, like you said like a lot of people sort of talk about all the great things that they're doing but not everyone's got a solution to everything right away right I think that's a amazing leap forward to to view things from a circular point of view and not just about waste so it's not just about recycling and taking things away from landfill and trying to deal with it after people are finished with it but you know even coming back to working with communities and coming right back to the start of it about going let's try and avoid creating it in the first place you know and then all the way through that journey of that circular journey and, it, and it's a massive space to be able to get to and a lot of um, really smart cookies are working on it at the moment which I'm glad to hear I'm glad that they're at because I think sharing all of those learnings is going to be really fun for everybody um, in terms of sort of preventing the waste and then having less to deal with at the end of that cycle so and the whole um, point of it's circular good to economy, hear your journey yeah the whole, yeah the whole point of circular economy is that it's, it's everyone in the whole supply chain it's people that design and manufacture products people that use the products and then people who reprocess them and so you know, we're, we're, we're trying to understand the part of the, the process that we represent. And as a council, we have a real opportunity to also connect some of the other parts together. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and have your own like peninsula ecosystem, right, of, of circularities that doesn't have to go off to the northwest. It can stay around the place and That's sort of work in with each other. Um, so love the dream. <laughs> <laughs> um you know what thank you so much for being so open and honest with you about all the programs that you're doing like you said you've got some geographical challenges but also gifted with so many beautiful places down on the Mornington Peninsula it must be a great place to work live absolutely <laughs> migrate to um and certainly um if anyone's sort of traveling around that area I know that you know it's quite often that people do exactly what I did with the photograph behind me is sort of take off towards the west and head along the Great Ocean Road out to Adelaide from Melbourne but please if you have the chance um, go down the eastern side and visit the Mornington Peninsula because it is gorgeous down there um, and you can touch um, and see all of the the great 
and the impact of all the great work that um, Daniel and all the team at the Mornington Peninsula Shire Council are doing. Uh, so thank you very much, um, everyone, for listening. Um, and thanks, Daniel, for speaking today. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. And until our next episode, bye for now. <laughs>